My fellow sheep, election season is upon us. Are you one of the 12% of Americans who still approves of our government? Then we need your help to force the other 88% into compliance. Our democracy depends on it. We're an organization called Citizens Against Too Much Unfettered Freedom, or CATMUF. CATMUF is a bipartisan flock of sheep whose goal is expanding government until nothing else remains. Because the government is here to help you. How can you help CATMUF help you? By only voting for candidates dedicated to expanding government. It's easy. You don't need to study the issues. No matter what a politician says when running for office, they're all dedicated to expanding government. And make sure you tell all your friends and family to vote for more government. Here at CatMuff, we don't care if you vote Democrat or Republican, as long as you vote for candidates committed to growing our federal family. CatMuff. Because folks just aren't smart enough to handle real freedom. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on theconsciousresistance.com and theseedsofliberty.com. So peaceful anarchism is covered by the Bibcot NoGov license. This allows reuse for anyone except for uh, governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information for this at bibcot.org. So today we have Vin Armani, who is the host of the Vin Armani Show on the Activist Post, or through the activistpost.com. Uh, um, and you can find him on Facebook, uh, Vin Armani is his Facebook page, and VinArmani.com, and Twitter at Vin Armani. So uh, he's good for consistency. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so we're going to discuss a little bit about his path to volunteerism, how he came to these concepts, what influenced him along the way, and also his views on agorism, um, and, and what that means to him, and the implications that could have for bringing about the uh, the end of statism, and also um, a recent interview he did with Jordan Peterson, which brought about some fascinating topics. So, uh, Vin, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Hey, Danilo, thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. I um, I heard about you through the um, uh, Anarchast, Jeff Berwick, and uh, I'm like, wow, this guy's uh, this guy's got it together. You know, he's uh, <laughs> doing some good work at the activist post. I've been following that 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 page for a while. Like, like I, I started into anarchism and volunteerism like, um, like five years ago, and I'm you know learning preach from Jekyll Island and most dangerous superstition and um, you know um, and Murray Rothbard books and all that, and you know and and, and activist pose is not necessarily like one particular ideology I guess it's just like general right just general posting of current event stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's I think it's moved farther into the sort of. Um, the the more of a advocating for a stateless society as time has gone on. I think it it really did start out as just kind of a sort of a, maybe a little bit left leaning, uh, maybe anti war, you know, uh, anti globalism sort of blog. But I think it's so, and certainly with us coming on board. But but as well, people like Derek Bros, you know what I mean, and and uh, they syndicate like True Stream Media a lot. It's I, I really I started following them before they reached out to me, but it's it's a pre, it's pretty coherent, and I think that the stuff that's on there is it reflects my own views almost almost every single article. Although what's great is that there's there are differing and dissenting voices, which I think is sometimes rare in uh, in independent media. No, no, definitely. It's great to have a, a, a dynamic, you know, a, a varied uh, mm -hmm. spectrum of voices. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, like you and then Derek Bros. I think I think I see like Carrie Wedler uh, sure. articles on there. So yeah, so a couple mm -hmm. of anarchist uh, authors and content creators on there, so which is great. Um, but um, but yeah, so please get into a little bit of your of your history, how you came to these concepts of volunteerism and anarchism. Uh, you know, it was, I, I think it was a, a slow evolution for me. It's hard to really pinpoint one particular, uh, one particular moment, but, um, I've, I, I guess I've always been a, a an anti-authoritarian. I've had a problem with authority for a long time. Um, and I was raised by, you know, two, two, Left-leaning, but relatively, I'd say, conservative when it came to you know going out and and bucking the the system and whatnot. They really wanted me to sort of fit in. I never did, but I, I uh, when I went to university, I studied philosophy, and it was in 
really getting a better grasp on logic and on reason and uh, being able to have some introspection about my own views that where I developed, I always had a strong sense of justice, but I, it was always very intuitive. It wasn't something where I could really understand inside myself, why is this ethical? Why is this moral? Why is this just? Why is this not just? And um, I, I mean, from there, it was, uh, it was just, I was, went back to LA where I'm, where I'm from, Southern California, and was involved in the entertainment industry and then involved in software, which had that sort of logic and reason at working on it every day. Uh, got involved in the, the protest movement uh, after 9-11 and with the, the war in Iraq from the first day that the bombs dropped, you know, I was out on the streets in LA. So I, I think I leaned pretty, pretty far left and ended up deeply embedded kind of in the left. I was... Uh, the director of fundraising for the LA County Greens for a period of time. Like I was, I was there. Like I was like, I was definitely, I believed on in the politics and I believed that politics could, mm. could change things. But I, I think that really my, my transformation happened when I discovered the pickup artist community in LA and really started into more self-development, trying to understand Myself, sort of through the vein of, of value, how to be a valuable person, and really trying to get all of those inconsistencies out of my being so that I could present sort of the, my most true self all the time because I was presenting myself to so many people that, you know, putting on a facade or, or, or lying or not, not presenting my true self, it was a lot of work. So, um, you know, the, it's, it's been a, a long road from there, but progressively over the years, I would run across certain thinkers. Um, and invariably the ones that really struck me were, were anarchist thinkers, right. In one, or at least libertarians. And that seemed to me to be the most consistent, uh, it, it seemed to me the, the most consistent way of living. And so many things that I saw in the state and the behavior of the state was so inconsistent. And, uh, and, and so I, I guess I just kind of ended up in the position that I'm in. I, I have been on a TV show for the last seven years um, that is that presents, I guess, some legal quandaries for some people. Um, but, you know, I believe that that what it is that that we represent is very is very ethical and very consistent. And it certainly is a gray market. Uh, and it certainly is all about a free market and voluntary exchanges and self-ownership and you know, living inside of that and embodying that really, truly embodying that for years. I mean, I, I don't think that there would be another political position that I could really hold. So, you know, from, from there, it's just been, it's just been kind of adding on top of itself and understanding more and more, even outside of that context, like how free markets and free people and voluntary interaction, how those things can actually work to make the world a better place. Yeah, you remind me of a of a book. I don't know if you, you know if you don't you don't, if you don't want to share what you uh, you know the TV show is about. It's fine, but I'll mention the book that you remind okay. me of, which is yes. um, Walter Block defending the undefendable. I don't know if you if you read, I've never read it. No, or no, if you heard no. about it, it's a wonderful book. It, it uh, I, I've read half of it, but I I kind of get the gist of it. And he, he wrote it in like the seventies, probably or the eight, early eighties, like a while ago. And basically, he he's going through every single um, maligned and scorned profession that people look down upon, like sure. just instinctively, you know, the prostitute, the pimp, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. the slumlord, the ticket scalper, <laughs> the blackmailer, the, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, what else? Uh, probably the speculator, you know, all these, all, all these different ways that people make money. Um, yet it's like what you said, it's just a voluntary interaction between two consenting parties. And really, if there is no victim, how can there be a crime, right? Right. And and that's right. and the, that's the uh, that's the consistency part, right? That's the that's the area where, when you really start to look into ethics and into morals, that the the further you de the further deep that you dig, the closer you come to anarchism and the further you move from any idea that the state could be legitimate. 
because not only is the state committing crimes that and and legitimizing the crimes of the state where there are victims, but they are creating crimes where there are no victims or they're they're ma- manufacturing them at sort of out of the ether, and it just becomes all about force. It's it's all about the gun in the room, and that there is no. There, that the authority doesn't come from any sense of justice, any sense of morals or any sense of ethics, which is fundamentally, I mean, that's where I think we would all like to see the order in the world come from. And I think it's the place that most people derive the order in their family, in their personal relationships, in their business relationships. I mean, we, we don't go and hang out with our friends and, and we don't come up with the decision of what we're going to do because one of us pulls a gun and forces the other ones to do it. Only the state has that kind of interaction. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, yeah, definitely. You're right. The, the gun in the room is the most, um, <laughs> is, is the most important thing and the, and the least, um, mm-hmm. the least referenced <laughs> thing. Right. Right. You know, it's like, that's why the origin of all these political euphemisms is not taxation. It, it's not, you know, extortion is taxation. It's not, it's not, yes. it's not counterfeiting. It's the mandrake mechanism or money creation or quantitative easing. You know, it's not getting a death threat. It's getting pulled over by the police, right? Right. <laughs> so, exactly. so many, so many euphemisms mm-hmm. to to disguise. It's, it. it's not, it's not kidnapping. It's uh, incarceration. Right. Right. Or, or or the war on drugs, or you know, right. or, sure. you know <laughs> punishing people for having a plant, a leaf mm-hmm. in their mm-hmm. pocket. Right. Um, exactly. But yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and you know, you reminded me of a um, of a recent conversation I had. I was at the grocery store last weekend, and I was talking to the cashier. And it's funny; I get the conversations I get into with these cashiers. And she and I was asking her; she's a college student, and she said, uh, "I said, what are you studying?" She said, "Forensic psychology." And I said, "Why? Why, why that?" And she's like, "Oh, because I want to learn about criminals." And I said, "You hmm. know, um, <laughs> how do you, actually?" I was saying, "How do you define a criminal? You know, a criminal is somebody who breaks the law." So, and I said, well, what, "What is the law? You know, a law is basically just opinion with a gun." Right, mm-hmm. so it's some old gray-haired guy in Capitol Hill said, you know, wrote, wrote, wrote some scribbles, said this is a law, and the, the law enforcement go out and enforce it with violence, and 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 so I was basically telling her that the majority, the vast majority of people that are in prison are there for victimless crimes. So sure. so how can you how can you use this word criminal to encompass everybody? Like, sure. of course, she's not referring to those people. She's referring to the violent criminals, <laughs> which everybody knows um, are evil people. Um, right. But I, I, I thought that was a great opportunity to introduce her to that idea. And she completely understood it. She's like, I know, right. you're right. It's, it's messed up. <laughs> but I mean, you would, you would think for those things that we all understand to be crimes, you need very little, I mean... You need very little law, right? You don't need books and books and books and books of regulations and criminal codes and municipal codes and all of these. You don't need all of that for the things that people really actually don't want to be occurring. Murder, rape, theft. It's really easy. And, you know, we got along for millions of years with those things existing in our society and no laws written down. It's that easy to figure out. Yeah. Yeah, you know, but it's, it's so you know that's always amazed me. And, and then I mentioned the book um, uh, Three Felonies a Day." I think how the feds target oh, target, yeah, target the innocent. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> and basically telling yeah, her we all commit them. And basically telling her that actually we're all criminals <laughs> because right. the myriad of of laws in the federal registry, and taxes, and regulations are so numerous that no person knows the extent of them. Not even mm-hmm. any politician who writes these mm-hmm. laws. They don't know it. No, either. especially any politician. Especially. <laughs> especially any politician. Because you would not become a politician if you really understood the scope of the laws. I mean, or or if you did, then we would know you were a psychopath, right? right. We The only thing that we can do when it comes to politicians is we have to assume, if we're going to give them the, the benefit of the doubt, that they're just ignorant. Because if they weren't ignorant, then that means they're evil because they want to be at the head of something that is ruining the lives of their fellow citizens, of their neighbors, and that they want to increase the power of this violent, coercive agency. And and they want to be – in many ways, they want to be exempt from that and they want to rule over people with the gun in the room. So it's either one or the other. Either you are ignorant of the fact of what government truly is. And then 
can you be excused if, you, if you're a politician? I, I don't know. That's you know, six of one, half dozen of the other. We can debate that. Mm -hmm. But if you're not ignorant, then you are truly a psychopath. Mm -hmm. And those are the exact people that we need to uh, that we need to be wary of, and that any society is in danger from. And those are the people that we elect into office. Yeah, when I was growing up, I, I was um, like 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 you. I was very interested in philosophy, and I was reading a lot of uh, ancient Greek philosophy, mm -hmm. and course, yeah. um, you know Plato and the Republic, things like that, and him and talking about the utopia and the philosopher king. You know, saying how mm -hmm. how the most ideal person to be a king is a philosopher in the same sense that you know the conductor of the orchestra knows all of the instruments and therefore he's the best um, person to lead and uh, you know manage the orchestra the philosopher is the best person to be a king to manage society and whereas that 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 analogy breaks down that analogy breaks down because the people in the orchestra are not tied they're not forced to be there right. <laughs> they can leave right, right. <laughs> they, they, they don't get punished if they don't pay their dues you know but like with violence they, they don't get thrown in, in a cage so it's a, so it's a big difference and so i um you know it, it kind of made sense to me at the time but then later the more i'm lear learning about anarchism and voluntarism it's like no even even a benevolent ruler who thinks he's doing good is still doing harm because there's absolutely course. no way you can rule over thousands or millions of people and try, attempt to micromanage and regulate their lives without causing, you know, massive harm. So, um, well, and it's and it's always it's the arrogance of our own will, right? That the idea that I personally could embody the self interest of even a hundred people. Yeah, I mean, seriously, right, like right. get get six or seven of even your best friends that you agree <laughs> with on almost on almost everything that you have the same sort of upbringing that you get them together in a room for a long enough period of time, and there's gonna be a disagreement, and it's gonna have to be solved in one way or the other. So the idea that there can even be a benevolent dictator. Um, is it's just it's it's logically inconsistent. It just can't happen. It's it's not a reflection of reality. But what it is a reflection of is it's a reflection of great arrogance. Mm. And intelligent people throughout history have convinced a lot of people that yes, it is possible. And I mean, we see it with socialists. That's I think that that's the that's the um, it's it's the uh, the temptation, as it were, the seduction of socialism is this idea that, oh, you're going to be part of a vanguard and you know what's right for the people. And, and yeah, when it's failed before, like they always say, well, that wasn't real socialism. That wasn't real <laughs> communism. If I was if I was in charge, what they're really saying is if I was in charge, it totally would have worked. Right. right. Stalin killed all those people. But that's because I wasn't in charge. <laughs> <laughs> if I was in charge, me, the philosopher king, it totally would have all worked out. The Russian people would, would have had the highest standard of living in the world because because I know what I'm doing right. and I'm the only one. And and obviously that's just not true. That's just you have to have a little bit of humility if you want to have a happy life. Uh, have you are you familiar with the video by Larkin Rose? If you were king. No, no, I'm not. <laughs> That's an awesome video. I will include that in the description. So basically, he goes through, um, you know, he's like, he's like, the world is a pretty messed up place, you know, all these people are getting, you know, imprisoned and caged for, for wrong, wrongful uh, things. And, you know, just, just, you know, you know, innocent people getting hurt. So, so, but what if you were, what if you were king, if you could feed the poor, you know, feed the hungry and, and, mm -hmm. and protect the, the, uh, the weak and, and uh, punish the, the wicked, you know, imagine the good you can do if you were king. <laughs> and he just goes through like very simple scenarios like maybe, maybe you want to make people be healthy. So you mandate everybody must do exercise every single day. And he's like, sure, but what if one person doesn't want to do his exercise? What are you going to do to him? <laughs> you going to beat him up? <laughs> or, you know, he's like, or what about, you know, is health, you know, eating your vegetables is healthy. Everybody must eat their vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> so, so any any mandate, any edict, no matter how um, well mean, well intentioned, benevolent, um, has a potential to do harm. And he's like, well, what if you just don't do anything? What if you just sit there and you don't do anything? Well, you're still doing harm because you're surviving on taxation, <laughs> which is itself <laughs> violent extortion. So there really is no way for you to be a a, a ruler and not do harm. It was it's just a wonderful little. <laughs> 
<laughs> I mean, it's it's totally the, the logic is right there. That's the and and I, I think that it really truly is. It is arrogance, and I think that that is one of the reasons why that has attracted me to voluntarism, to anarchism. The people who are principled voluntarists, principled anarchists, the one thing I think that everybody shares, who who are the real deal, not just who are the people who are trying, who are able to sort of talk the talk and it gets them a little bit of attention, but the people who are the real deal, who really aspire to live it, it is a spiritual it is a spiritual practice. It is really something where, where you are taking a stand, a principled stand that is the exact same stand that go through any of the great spiritual teachers in history. And it's the exact stand that they're talking about all the way back to the idea of the golden rule, you know, that it's, and it is, and it's the golden rule. And it's, it's about rulers, right? That it's like, do unto others as you, as you'd want them to do unto you. You don't, obviously the king doesn't want someone ruling over him. Right. (laughs) If he, if he wanted someone ruling over him, he wouldn't be the king. (laughs) He'd appoint someone else to be the king. So do unto others as you want done unto you. You don't want somebody ruling over you, don't rule over them. Yep, well said. So uh, maybe we should go on to um, agorism. And, uh, sure. So if you could maybe just define agorism, what it means to you, and, um, and why you think it's important for you know, anarchists and volunteers to get acquainted with it. So agorism is a term that was coined by uh, Samuel Edward Conkin III. He first coined it in a book, I believe it was late 70s, um, I think seven, I want to say 78 or 79, but uh, it was called New Libertarian Manifesto. I actually suggest anybody who's interested in agorism that they leave that book for maybe second. It's not, fu- it's, it's a great book, but his thoughts aren't fully formed. Mm-hmm. The one that I would suggest is the second book that he wrote, which is called an agorist primer or an agorist primer, depending on if you're from the US or the UK. But um, <laughs> In an agorist primer, uh, the way that he describes agorism in the, the very first pages is he said that agorism is thought and action consistent with freedom. So that's, that's, what, that's what it is. It's, it's, it's behavior. It's a lifestyle. It's a, a principled philosophical stance and a way of living your life. So it's it's thinking and acting in ways that are consistent with freedom, which is I think something that we that it's what we're doing right now, right? Having this conversation and tearing down the idea of, you know, a king doesn't want someone ruling over him, so therefore he shouldn't rule over someone else. It's about consistency. And mm-hmm. he's he he harps on consistency. Basically, why he wrote this book was he was writing in response to um, Rothbard basically tying his wagon to the Koch brothers, or at least one of the Koch brothers, sort of forming the Cato Institute, working for and, – and the formation of the Libertarian Party. So – Agorism and also voluntarism. It's it's the same kind of group in San Francisco that started the volunt the voluntarist, the sort of um, magazine newsletter, whatever you might want to call it, which is where most of us are drawing when we call ourselves voluntarists. Mm. We're really drawing it from that group. So a, a lot of those writings are still online. I believe it's the voluntarist.com, but you yeah. can just go type in voluntarist, yeah. right? Yeah, I'm sure you've you've seen them, yeah, right? Yeah, so yeah. most of those writings are from the the late seventies, early eighties. Um and it's this same group. It's basically against sort of status libertarians. It's a, it's a reaction against status libertarians or, or the libertarian party, right? Seek, he, his basic argument is that seeking political power over others in order to eliminate political power over others is inconsistent. It's a logically – and philosophically, ethically, and morally inconsistent position. So therefore saying, I'm going to, I would like you to vote for me to be the head of the government so I can fix the problems in the government. (laughs) I want you to put me in a position of immorality so that I can basically fix it from the inside. And there's a lot of reasons why that's, there's a lot of reasons why that's inconsistent. There's a lot of reasons why that doesn't work, which he goes into. Um, one of the things, though, that that most people, I think, draw out of agorism is in some ways, I think it's a misunderstanding of, of 
of Konkin. What, mo- what many people draw out of it is this idea of, and what's, beca- what's the most sort of popular aspect of it, is this idea of counter-economics, which he discusses. And what he's talking about when he talks about counter-economics is he basically says there, there are kind of four, four classes of markets. So the first market that he describes is white markets. And that's basically the, the market that most of us know. It's where you, you go and get a business license and you pay your taxes and you, you, know, you follow all the laws of the state and you do your business underneath the state and there are parasites sucking on you. Mm-hmm. What he says is that if you understand the principles that taxation is theft, for instance, then to behave in a way that puts money in the thieves' hands with no fight, with no, no desire to, um, to stop it, is basically for all of those people who do see it as theft, you are now legitimizing theft. So when you – theft is always immoral. Mm-hmm. So when you – just because you agree to be stolen from doesn't make the theft moral. And in fact, it starts to make you into an immoral person who is enabling – the criminal who is enabling the thief, right? So you don't, you become an apologist in that way. So that's white markets. He says that's inconsistent with freedom. Um, well, to, to go back a little bit, the word agorism comes from the word agora, which is a Greek word, which means the open marketplace. And basically, so he was coining that he's talking about free markets. Certainly he's coming from a, a standpoint of Austrian economics. Absolutely. Um, so he shares he shared a lot in common with the people who grew the libertarian party. I mean, he was a student of Rothbard. Rothbard, you know, in terms of not like a physical student, but he had studied what Rothbard was doing. Rothbard certainly knew him and commented on his his work of agorism. He'd, he'd read it, and in New Libertarian Manifesto, in in recent printings, there's actually Rothbard's critique is actually right afterwards. So it's it's interesting to read, but. Um, in terms of the agora, what he's talking about is this uh, this open marketplace. And what you want to think is, if you imagine the the free market working well, no state, no regulations, none of this. What you and you imagine it working sort of perfectly, the ideal utopian free market. What it requires is it requires the people inside that agora to be ethical. To behave in an ethical way. The whole reason why people would people are, and you hear this all the time, having a conversation with the status. What do we do about people who steal? What do we do about businesses that pollute the environment? What do we do about, you know, fraud? What do we need the state to solve these things? But what it's so so really what you are saying is that you don't believe that people can be more ethical than they are. You believe that the level of sort of ethical consistency that we have reached at this point is the end. And you also believe that technology can't provide some solutions to that. I think that we're seeing things like the blockchain where, uh, where cryptography is creating these levels of trust, you know, where, you know, Uber, Airbnb, I think until these, businesses were actually done. I mean, you've got single women going and staying in the homes owned by strange men Hmm. who have keys to the house, who in some cases are staying in the house when they're there. (laughs) And you're, and this is thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, probably millions every year of people doing this. Hmm. And where, where are all the murders? Where are all the kidnappings? Where are all the people getting their stuff stolen? Right. This is the Agora, because most of us actually behave pretty ethically on a day to day basis. There are the unethical actors. So those unethical actors, he uh, Konkin really moves into this other market for the most part called the red market. And that's the market where it's predicated on violence. So these are hit men. These are violent drug cartels. You know, these, this is the military industrial complex. These are, are uh, private military contractors, et cetera. People who's, who traffic in blood. He calls this the red market. But he says that where the agora can grow is in the gray and the black markets. I, for, I for one, really believe that the place is the gray market. 
I, I think that black markets necessarily turn red. And I think that probably, you know, he's writing this in the early 80s that we see it a lot more now. I mm. think maybe if he was able to take a look at Mexico and the issues that have happened with the drug cartels down there mm-hmm. in particular, in particular, but in other places in the world as well with the human trafficking and whatnot, I think that he might have had a different opinion about the role of black markets, right? I think he was really more specifically talking about what was at the 70s, a a pretty innocuous black market in in drugs, really, was primarily what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, In terms of gray markets, what he's talking about is he's talking about markets that uh, that operate otherwise like a white market would. Um, Could be a store, whatever. You know, a store that takes cash only pays their employees under the table and doesn't pay taxes. Mm. This is a gray market, right? This is a, this is a gray marketeer. This is somebody operating in the Agora because that's what a market would look like if there was no state. So what he advocates for is he says, look, if you want to build the stateless society, here's the Agora, here's the state around it, right? Every, it's like you inflate the, the you have to inflate the free market for real, not for talking about it. You have to inflate the Agora. So it starts out you and I, right? And we do a deal on Craigslist for, for cash. I buy, I don't know, I buy a laptop for cash from you, or you're selling laptops, you know, buying and selling them on Craigslist. You're not paying taxes, you didn't go get a business license, you didn't do any of that. Every single one of those transactions, that's the Agora. And what he says is that when you start expanding out the Agora and you you make a decision, particularly entrepreneurs starting a business, you make a decision that I'm going to go gray market with this for, for a principled reason. Like it's not just because I don't want to pay taxes, but when you – so he says it's two things. It's thought and action. So it's the counter economics, which is the gray and black markets, and it's libertarian thought together. So you're doing this because – you have a, a, a philosophical and principled problem with contributing to the state as a white marketeer. So you're looking as the, as the Agora expands, the state loses ground. And each area that it expands into, so maybe it just starts out at a retail level, and then it's a wholesale level, and then it's manufacturing, and then it's agriculture, and then it's protection – Right. Mm. As we come up with these solutions and we have solutions like like the blockchain, like Bitcoin, then and it's banking and it's, you know, money transfer and it's and it expands and expands and expands until you eventually his 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 idea is that when people are being agorists, when a critical mass of people are agorists, it expands. It leaves more room for people to see that this agorism works. They're spreading libertarian thought. They're pushing the idea that the state is immoral. It's giving people a moral basis to act inside the the gray and black markets. And as that expands out, the state, the state just loses any ground. So maybe, maybe at some point with an established agora, the state is still there, which I think most agorists understand that. It's not about collapsing and destroying the state. It's this vision that at any given time, the state is still there as a remnant, but it just can't even touch you. Hmm. It's so small and impotent (laughs) that it can't exercise its will in the Agora because, for instance, the power of the protection inside the Agora or the power of the privacy, you're seeing that with Bitcoin right now where the IRS has to go after third parties like Coinbase to get their records because otherwise the IRS can't tax it. (laughs) <laughs> the IRS can't – they don't have the technology. They don't have the ability to do it. And as we see the third parties start to go away and we see people do – have their own nodes, which is coming, and, and have the blockchain interactions between each other, the government just can't touch it unless you give it to them. And the reason that you won't give it to them is because you – we've spread libertarian ideas and we, people understand that no taxation is theft. It's not your civic duty. As a matter of fact, it's the exact opposite. Your civic duty is to not give more money to the murderers, to the thieves, to the kidnappers. Your civic duty is to build the agora in a peaceful and ethical way. So that's what agorism is. It's it's a practice and it's a belief about how we move from here to a free market, a truly free market. And the free market just means free people. So it's it's 
action and thought consistent with freedom. Beautifully stated. Um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> you know, the, I was just thinking that I, I really believe that um, kids, you know, teenagers are inherently agorists in the same way that when we're all born, we're inherently anarchists yes. because we don't really recognize authority figures until, right. until you know, um, you know, you have an authoritarian upbringing until you go to, you know, government school until you, you know, things like that. And you, you really learn your place of being inferior. Um, That's right. So, so kids, cause you know, um, around here it snows a lot where I live. And, and so we had these two teenagers come by wanting to shovel our snow for $20. <laughs> that wasn't tags, <laughs> you know? And, and, and I'm sure as a teenager who doesn't really know what taxes are, um, they just see twenty dollars like this is awesome, and then and then the father comes or the mother and says, "You got to pay tax on that." And they're like, "What? Why? <laughs> it's your civic right. duty. You have to do your duty to society, your obligation for being a citizen." And it doesn't make sense. <laughs> you know? Well, I mean, you know, the, the interesting part is that most people's first real experience with taxes actually isn't that. Most people's first real experience with taxes is the first paycheck that they get, right? And the thing is, it's just gone. And I think almost everybody has had that same experience of looking at the check, right. of having thought how much it should be, mm. right? You've ca calculated it in your mind. Okay, first paycheck, all right, man. Like I got – I was working for two weeks. That's 80 hours. I was getting paid whatever it was. You're like, right. okay. And then you look and you're like, what? The fuck? <laughs> what and what is this and what is this social security and this is what is this and the, if you're in a state that takes state income tax you're like i didn't even it's not even in your head right mm. and it's just taken there's nothing you can do about it you you feel bad about it for a little while but then it becomes so normal right so normal and at that beginning stage you're probably not making enough money that you're actually see this is the trick it takes so much indoctrination to get people to do the things that the state wants to do. That's why they spend so much money on public schools. That's why they spend so much money on propaganda is because it's hard. You, you, like most people, they get to adulthood and they've got to unlearn all the indoctrination. If you're not indoctrinated, like anarchism, it seems obvious to you, right? Mm -hmm. Like it seems totally obvious. But once you're indoctrinated, it's because – you don't earn enough. So then at the end of the year, you're like, okay, now I'm going to get my money back. <laughs> right now. <laughs> see, that's the trick. That's the trick that it's like, okay, now I'm going to continue to play the game because that's the agreement. Right. The agreement is that I'm going to go and I'm going to fill out my 1040 EZ because I don't make that much money and I'm going to send it to them and they're going to send me back a check with all my money. And you do that for a little while until you start making enough money that – the that's like your second, uh, your second little hit, right? Because you've been getting your money back until you make enough money that you're like, you 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 send it off at, or you you fill it out and you're like, wait, I owe money, <laughs> like I I owe more than what they took out of my my check, and that's that same sinking feeling that you felt when you got that first paycheck. But you know what? It's been too long now. It's been too long. They've got you. They've got you. You're done. And they've got a record of all this time that you pay taxes. So now when you don't, oh, you best believe, best believe they're coming for you because it's – no, no, no. You, you, we need it now. We need it now and we know that you'll pay it. So it's, it's funny how much work has to be put in to get you under their heel so that, you, so that you'll just be like – and that's what most people are doing. They're acquiescing. You know, and if they say, oh, it's my civic duty, it's just to make themselves feel better. It's just to justify and rationalize how shitty they feel and how much they've been stolen from. You know what I mean? For them to not feel like because because what's the alternative? The alternative is to be like, wow, I've let myself be victimized for how many years now? Hmm. I, and I've done nothing. I've let this person – it's like the kid who's got a bully and eventually at, – at school and eventually the kid just knows. The bully walks up and he goes – sticks out his hand <laughs> right. and he's beat this kid up for his lunch money so many times that the kid's just like, all right. And maybe at some point the kid even identifies it like, oh, hey, for, 
here. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> it's it's that time. A, it's that time of the year. Reaction. It's that time of the month again. <laughs> you know what I mean? So so yeah, man. That's what it is. It's a it's a big giant bully that, that's very successful and has been for ten thousand years. Yeah, yeah, and people who say yeah, taxation is voluntary. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's really really a confusing a confusing statement because it's like. It's like, like you said, if a mugger comes up to you with a gun and says, give me your money and you, and, and you give, maybe you're happy. Let's say you're happy to give it. Does that, is it not theft because you're happy? No, you had no other choice. Basically, it's die <laughs> or right. give your money. And so basically we act, most people act out of self-preservation, right? They, sure. they, they don't want to be harassed. They don't want to be uh, investigated or, or uh, you know, have any kind of attention on their lives. So they give in, right? But, um, mm. but uh, yeah, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, so in my family... Um, there's a lot of Democrats, and um, <laughs> and, uh, and my mother is a passionate Bernie Sanders supporter. Ooh, socialist. Um, <laughs> and so and so, you know, with, with this podcast, like I don't make a lot of income. You know, I get donations. You know, hundred dollars sometimes, two hundred dollars. And so when I got a, a good amount of donation, my mother's like, "So, um, are you gonna pay taxes on?" <laughs> And I just laughed. I couldn't. I didn't know what right, else. Of this, course, what else can you do, what right? Else I, did, I think, and I think she was serious too. I mean, I'm I sure thought, she was. <laughs> I'm sure she was. But I couldn't help it. <laughs> I mean, you know that the funniest, the funniest thing to me about the whole taxation is voluntary thing is, okay, I I can understand that. Let's say for this person, you know, if they're speaking from their own experience, right? I'll take them at their word that they're like, no, I voluntarily pay taxes. It's not theft. I voluntarily pay it. And I say, okay, well, what, what percent do you pay? What, how much did you pay? You know, let me see your last tax return. Like what was the amount on it? And maybe they paid and they're like, okay, it was, you know, this, however many thousand dollars and however many cents. And I'm like, why that amount? Like if it's voluntary, why didn't you send an extra 20? Why didn't you send an extra 100? Yeah. Why didn't you send why didn't you send another 10% of your income? Since it's voluntary because you know what the things that I do voluntarily it's it, if they're good, if they're things that I'm happy to do, I don't just do them a little bit. You know what I mean? It's not it's not like I'm like, "Hey, I'm going to the beach, but I'm only going for uh 15.3 uh minutes." <laughs> It's like, no, right. I'm going to go from the su- from sun up to till I'm so exhausted. Right, right. So it's like, so if it's voluntary, why didn't you give till it hurts? Why did you only why didn't you only give the minimum that you were asked to give? And that's the reason why is cuz it's not voluntary at all and they're just justifying it to themselves. Exactly. Exactly. Um so so um yeah, before we go, please get into your interview with uh, Jordan Peterson because uh, I think you covered some very fascinating topics in that. Well, it, it's it's interesting. It, it at the time that we're recording this, I actually recorded it yesterday, which was the the twentieth. So uh, Monday, the twentieth of February. I advise everybody to go check that out. YouTube.com/slash Vin Armani. It was a great uh, a great interview. He's somebody that I'm sure a lot of the people who watch you are familiar with. For the people who aren't, very interesting guy, and has I, I think while he doesn't doesn't ascribe to being an anarchist per se. His work actually deals a lot with what the state is on a psychological level, Hmm. tracing all the way back into the mythology of Egypt. And really, it has um, improved my own understanding of what the state is, what the psychology behind the state is, sort of, and not just that, but broader than, you know, he's saying the state, not just as government, sort of as we say the monopoly of violence in a particular geographic area, not necessarily that, but the cultural order, as it were, right? The rules, norms, and the the cultural order, that which brings order out of chaos within any group of people, he's more referring to that as the state, and that the state over time does get old and corrupt and and willfully blind, and that that's uh, part of the mythology of, of ancient peoples, like I say, stretching back, you know, 6,000 or more years, 10,000 years even, and that this is something that that people have understood on a spiritual and psychological level for a long time. But in that particular interview, one of the things, it's really, it's, it's really helped me in terms of my understanding, um, and I've had a lot of revelations actually about agorism itself, 
through that conversation that really even since the beginning of time that the real message has been if you want to improve the state, if you want to fix the state, if you want to see it be different, it's not about an external change. It's about an internal change. It's about behave, behaving in a way that is morally and ethically, ethically consistent in your own life, in your own life only. That's, and that's it. Like there isn't anything more than that. And that when you have a group of people who are behaving in a way that's morally and ethically consistent around each other, well, you get what Konkin called the Agora. You get a state that works. You don't need violent coercion. You, and you don't have people who fear their neighbors, right? So you you have a I, I would use an Amish community, but I would maybe want one that's a little more voluntary. I think a lot of that is mythology. But if you have a voluntary a voluntary community of individuals who are, who all believe that everybody else is acting ethically and truly believe that, and have truly chosen to live together, you really don't need a state. And so then, the converse is that when you decide to be realistic, as Konkin says, when you decide that, oh no, I can't be ethical all the time. I mean, sometimes you need to lie. I mean, sometimes you need to steal. Sometimes you need to do what's expedient, which he, Konkin would argue that's what the Libertarian Party is really doing, is that they're saying, <laughs> well, the only, you know, let's be realistic. I mean, we can't really have no state, like we have to have some state, but let's be realistic, let's be realistic. <laughs> And the fact of the matter is that it's the re the realistic viewpoint is if when you have a bunch of people who are all acting ethically and morally who agree on that, you don't need a state. When you have a bunch of people who are lying to themselves and who in whatever vein, maybe on this little issue, but I think being a taking political action is a big issue. Running for office, I think, is a big issue. But when you get those people together acting inconsistently, acting immorally, you get enough of them in one place, you're going to have the state. You're going to have violent coercion because it, it's just, it's a pit of snakes. It's immorality just piled on top of, on top of, on top of. So the place to move is morality within yourself, right? Teaching your children that, you know, peaceful parenting, totally a believer in that, that it's in your own life, make relationships with people, around you, surround yourself with people who have voluntarily agreed to behave in that same way. Teach your children that as well. And when enough of us decide that that's the right thing to do, you got a little Agora going. And it's a great example and people will want to be around it and it grows and it grows and it grows. And I think we're seeing a lot of that in the, this community. I think that the work that you're doing is helping to grow that Agora. The work that we're all doing is helping to grow it. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see that it's happening. But I, I think that that is the message. Uh, for me, that's the message. That's why I call myself an agorist is, is that I'm about making that change inside myself and, and helping people to see through example that, that, that's, that that's the moral choice. And I think the stateless society flows from that. Anarchism flows from that. So voluntarism flows from that. It's just, it's a logical progression of that behavior. You know, you know, sometimes I, uh, <clears throat> define the state as, um, the way Mark Stevens does, which is, mm. um, um, it's just a, uh, you know, the state doesn't exist. You know, it's just a men and women with guns forcing you to pay them. Right. That's it. So, and you know, the idea that's that, um, you know, like some people say, you know, I, I'm, we need to abolish the state to me. That is the same thing as saying we need to abolish Santa Claus. We need to abolish the Easter Bunny. We need to abolish the Tooth Fairy. <laughs> it is. <laughs> you know? it is. It's just it is. it's just people who believe they have an exemption to morality that we are yes. all subject to. That's it. Yes. That's it. <laughs> you know. And That's when it. more and more people understand that fundamental concept, then you will not give them this power that you believe they have, right? Because where does power come from? It comes from the people giving them attention, participation. Um, and, in, and in fact, what you will, what is true and what has been true, and the reason why I often tell people morality and ethics, it, at least as I understand it and what has become clear to me is that it's not a prescription, it's a description, right? right? Exactly. It's yeah. not that somebody sat down and said, what is moral? Let me see, what is moral? Okay, don't kill people, don't steal, no. It's a description of, you know what, when everything is going good and we're happy 
how are people behaving? Right. <laughs> they're not killing people. They're not stealing. <laughs> that's what. That's all morality is. Right. That's it's it, it's it's an evolved description of hey, I'm sitting around. I'm happy. You're happy. We're friendly. We like each other. What are the rules that what is what is it that we're not doing right now that if we were doing it, we would not be happy? It's just a description. And the thing is that peace, people who are in peace, who feel free, because that's really the freedom Conkin's talking about when he says um, action and thought consistent with freedom. The freedom that he's talking about is the freedom from worry of both the chaos on one side of nature just taking its taking its toll on you and a worry from your fellow man that he's going to violently coerce you. So you want to make others around you free. They make you free. And the thing is free people live good. You can't live better than the way that free, happy people who have a chance to evolve their consciousness and solve the problems around them without other people hindering them, you can't live better than that. Mm -hmm. There is no more powerful situation that a group of human beings can be in. So what it is that we're talking about in this case is it's not about abolish the state at all. It's about, yo, start living in a way that you don't think the state is even necessary in your life. Yeah. Start start living as though the state doesn't exist. Like, how would you need to live if you couldn't sue somebody? How would you need to live if you couldn't lock your door? Who would you need to surround yourself with? How would you need to behave towards them? What would you need to think about on a daily basis? How would you need to do your business deals if you couldn't write a contract? If every business deal had to be a handshake, how ethical would you be? Mm -hmm. And that's it. You, you know, you remind me of, uh, I don't know if you saw that, um, <clears throat> it was a, a question on Facebook by Julie Borowski, uh, it's, mm. and it's based on that, that movie, The Purge, um, you know, sure. Energy, and, uh, and, and her question was, um, if there were no laws, I don't know, maybe for 24 hours, let's say, what would you do? <laughs> and the top comments with like the most likes were, was like, um, open 11 eight stand. <laughs> Right. <laughs> exactly, man. Drink, drink raw milk. Uh, do an improvement on my house. <laughs> uh, cut hair without. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Braid someone's hair without. You know? <laughs> Isn't that amazing, man? That it's but so and and the interesting thing about it is that and I think that this is something that certainly as anarchists we need to explore more. And it's uh, you know not to certainly end this thing on a downer or anything, but. Um, those people that the status are worried about, right? Those people that they have been indoctrinated to be worried about are so few and far between. I do believe that they always exist in society. Sure. Uh, they're the people that I think that we call psychopaths. Mm -hmm. I, there's, it's something that I've studied. It's something that I've wanted to understand because like you say, most people, were there no laws, would live their life pretty much exactly as they are now. They would do nothing more uh, less moral or less ethical than they're doing now. They wouldn't the the people who are not killing people, not stealing and all of these things out of fear of being caught, I would actually prefer to know who those people were. Personally, I would actually prefer that there were no laws and that those people felt the license to go and do what it was that they were going to do. Because you know what? You clean up society really, really right. fast. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know exactly. Like, I don't want you to be held back by laws. No, the real psychopaths aren't held back by laws anyway, mm -hmm. right? True. But, you know, all of these things where people are like, well, if there was no state, you know, prime example. The Purge is about us. It's a state holiday. The Purge is this idea of it's a law that there's the Purge. Like the Purge <laughs> wouldn't exist in a stateless society. You understand what right, I'm saying? Right, right, like right. that's the crazy part about it. Like the Purge, <laughs> the whole basis of the idea of the Purge is that it's a statist creation. So if you're worried about the Purge, you should be worried about the state because in an anarchist society, you don't get the purge because if the purge happened, that would be the end of the society. 
you wouldn't be able to put it back together again. And quite frankly, there aren't enough – those people would be weeded out. It wouldn't be one year, one day of the year where they were all able to get together in psychopathic groups and go out and hunt people. <laughs> they do it themselves from a young age, and they would be, okay, that guy, he doesn't get to participate. Oh, that guy's over there killing small animals? We know what's going on with him. Like we've got a little – he somehow gets lost in the woods, you know, like I hate, I hate to, I, I mean, I, I hate to be kind of morbid and, and, um, you know, some people may be like, oh, that's, 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 that's evil. But that's how societies, that's how tribal societies hit. You think there weren't psychopaths in tribal societies? Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Right. You think that there wasn't some paranoid schizophrenic who showed up in, in, in some indigenous society every once in a while? Like you know who those people are mm -hmm. from a from a very and it's I'm not trying to be cruel about it. I know that we would like to take care of everybody, but when you're in a situation where there is no state hospital to lock them up in, there is no one with a gun, and nobody's in, in interested in holding a gun to their head or locking them in a cell. You know, society has ways that it it figures it figures it out. We have our solutions now. I mean, is incarcerating millions of people for victimless crime better? than mm. dealing with the occasional psychopath. You know, yeah. as Thomas Sowell says, there, there are no solutions, only trade-offs. Mm. And that's the trade-off, yeah. right? So, I mean, it's, uh, that's something that I'm still exploring more of how to sort of talk about that, which because I think it's something that certainly scares a lot of people and definitely scares a lot of statists because that's why they want the state to protect them from psychopaths. Unfortunately, it's the psychopaths who are most interested in having power. Right. You know, all you got to do is look at a presidential election. And if if you don't see the psychopaths standing on either side or, or on all three sides or on all four sides, right? If you don't see the psychopaths that are the top contenders and you don't see them as the top psychopaths, then you really do, you really are not do not have your eyes open. <laughs> exactly. So, so uh, before we go, I want to ask you a question, but um, I also want to say my definition of an, uh, agorism, uh, the way I describe it to people when they ask me is um, – Transacting outside of the state, raising your kids outside of the state, yep. having your business outside of the state, just living your life outside yes. of the state, not recognizing its existence. Yeah, yeah as though it didn't exist. Right. As, as, that, as, live, as, live your life as though the state didn't exist. That is that is agorism. I right. mean, that's that's it. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and so I wanted to ask you one question because you, when you talked about um, the Libertarian Party and how um, Konkin was criti cri critical of it and how they, you know, aspire to positions of power, and how contradictory that notion is. Um, what are your thoughts on Adam Kokesh? Um, it's right, right. I'm, deba I'm debating him tomorrow, actually. Oh, really? I'm doing a live, I'm doing a live debate with him tomorrow. Oh, so it's funny that you, nice. funny that you bring him up. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean that that's that's definitely well, you know, it's it, he's running for not president. And so in many ways, he's already won because he's not president, right? So he's, <laughs> he's an incumbent. Why are you running? Stop running. I'm not president, <laughs> so, so I'm I not figure, president either. I figure, no. he's, I figure he's, he's, he's running for re-election, I guess, as not president <laughs> since he's already, he's already <laughs> not president. Um, look, I, I think my, my belief with, with Adam is the Libertarian Party is not going anywhere. They're going to be around. And the state is not going anywhere in the next four years. Mm. And if anyone if i would would want anyone to be running for a uh, libertarian party president i mean it's very unrealistic to think that he might, he would win but simply anybody running yeah i would prefer him to the goofballs that would would like to run and they that they've trotted out to run would i prefer adam kokesh to do that absolutely um do I respect him for bringing a lot of people to I, – I, I know that he has brought a lot of people to oh, yeah. this way of thinking. Yeah, yeah. I have to respect him for that. Sure. And, and I think that he actually plays a you – know, while, while he's never espoused to be an agorist, he's never he's, – he's living his own truth. And what I do know is that there is no doubt that by him doing what he's doing that he will bring a lot of people through that little entry point, you know. And on to anarchism. I think he'll do that more effectively than Ron Paul did. I mean, I talked to so many people who are anarchists and they say that that was their first entree into this whole thing was the Ron Paul campaign, that they started out as status and that they, through that, 
do I think he's he's a more effective bridge than Ron Paul? Absolutely, man. The guy's is fucking dynamic. So, you know, do I do I think he's going to win? No. Do I think that he's taking a morally consistent uh, anarchist principled anarchist position? Absolutely not. But do I think that there's a whole lot of value in him doing what he's doing for us moving toward a stateless society? One hundred percent. So I mean, so that's you know that's what I feel about him. Yeah, yeah. I would also recognize that uh, yeah he has made uh, tremendous um, um, you know uh, he, he's really helped a lot of people yeah make the transition like with his man in the street videos with his book with you know so many things that he has done. Um, he's really helped a lot of people come to these concepts um, and understand them much more deeply. Um, <clears throat> but you know, for me, even somebody who's <clears throat> Uh, a libertarian or an anarchist uh, as a president, and and like he said, like he's like, if I'm president, we're gonna take it down. What is it? For, what does he say? From the top down, we're gonna we're gonna end this program, end that program. And so basically, the way I look at that is, <clears throat> it's kind of the same way as um, people say, well, the state is good because the state got rid of slavery, or the state right. is good because the state got rid of the Jim Crow laws, right? They, the, a law those was passed. Ex- those wouldn't have existed without the state, <clears throat> right? So, so chattel slavery was the, was the function of the state, right? It was it Absolutely. was state, it has it to was be state sanction. Jim it Crow, has to be. Jim Crow segregation laws was a function of the state. So, Absolutely. forced segregation by law is just as immoral, or uh, yeah, as as forced integration. So, of for, so for that reason. I can't get behind somebody, even an anarchist, as president, forcibly, because anything that a government does is force, he's sure. forcibly abolishing these institutions. Whether, now, it, it's like, <clears throat> it, it, and, and, you know, it, it kind of goes contrary to my whole um, um, philosophy and what I espouse. Basically, I'm focusing on the individual, focusing on the mind. We have to reach mm-hmm. the people in their minds. Statism is a belief. It's not just... It's not just the buildings. It's not just this agency and that agency. The, the only reason that they have power is because millions of people believe they have power and believe they're legitimate and obey their edicts and commands. So doing away with that is, to me, like hacking at the branches. But the we're talking about we're people, talking about it as if he actually has a chance. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know you're right. You're like, right. He that's chance. which is which he does, which he does it. I know, so I know. I you're right, that, you're right. I, th- but, I think I think that to criticize him for an action that he will never take, right. or a position that he will never hold, <laughs> right, right, is I don't I don't know how we do that, right? right. So it's it, what we really have to to see is will it be a net positive to have? And look, I'm I would never do it. I don't vote. For me, it would be a morally and ethically and logically inconsistent thing for me to do as an anarchist to say I'm going to run for president. But is it – I mean is it really if – and I don't don't think he's this much of an evil genius. But the (laughs) the fact of the matter is any vote for Adam Kokesh is is essentially a no vote. And it's, like Mickey, it's, it's not voting for the other party, right? So these are people who were going to go to the polls. Mm. I don't think that he's going to get – there's going to be maybe a few. Maybe there might be some, some you know, little girl fans of his who had flirted, <laughs> flirted with the idea of not voting uh-huh. who are like, but I'll just vote for you. You know what I mean? <laughs> there may be a tiny amount of those. But those of us who don't vote already, none of us are going to vote for Adam Kokesh. Mm-hmm. Right? right. So the only people who <laughs> votes no. So the people whose votes he's going to get are people who possibly would have voted for someone else, and in the course of that, hopefully, you know, they get exposed to other anarchists. They start looking around. They start looking at his other stuff. They start looking at his other interviews with with different people, and they read his book. And, you know, I I think it could be I think it could be a net positive. I I. I mean, I don't think that he's that much of an evil genius that he's got that <laughs> out. I mean, I think he's I think this is a great project for him. And I, you know, I think that he's going to have a, it's a great adventure and I think he's going to have a fucking great time. And I think that it's uh, I think it's a logical progression of, of who he's been to go ahead and do this. But um, 
you know, I can't criticize him for for something he'll never do. I, I, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm I'm extremely grateful for him at all the work he's done, and I follow his YouTube channel, and I love his man the street videos. But it's just it just seems to me so contradictory when he's talking is, to somebody. It, no, he, he's is. talking to it somebody. Is. He's like, you know, government is immoral. It's violent, taxation is theft, and at the end mm-hmm. of every video, vote for me, Adam. <laughs> I'm like, I almost have to try not to laugh. You know, he's, I, I, he's an entertainer, man. He's an entertainer. You know, it's it's it's. It's cool. Well, I mean, you know, we yeah. we each we each have to walk our own path, and right, I think right, part right. of this is, you know, there's got to be that amount of humor in there. There's got to be the amount of ridiculousness because the state is ridiculous, true. you know. That's and I true. think that that's one of the most powerful points of view that we can have is to stop being scared of it, and to start looking at, you know, look at your average politician. Just listen to them talk. Mm. Like they are ridiculous. Go into any bureaucracy, go into the DMV and look around. If you can't see the absurdity of that situation, then you, I mean, I don't know what you think is absurd. If you don't think that that what's going on in the DMV is absurd or go to a business licensing department or go to any of these things where it's like fill out this form in triplicate. Dude, it's all it's a parody. <laughs> right like it's a total so that level of ridiculousness that level of absurdity that adam adds into the whole thing i think it's it's perfect it's it's par for the course you know what i mean <laughs> all right i'll, I'll look for the comedy in it but <laughs> but uh vin thanks a lot for coming on the show i really appreciate it so um before i let you go um yes. please um i always ask this of all my guests what is yes. your favorite quote of all time Oh my good! My favorite quote of all time. Of oh yeah, any qu- yeah, yeah. Whatever comes to mind, like what well, you know, one of your favorites. Oh my <laughs> goodness! Uh, on this, on the spot, man. I know. I purposely um, don't don't, uh, don't uh, warn people of this question. I, I like to see the the, the look yeah, of shock, yeah, the shock good. and amazement. <laughs> uh, I mean. It, certainly in terms of, of anarchism, I, it's the Lysander Spooner quote, and hopefully I won't uh, butcher this, but because a man is able to choose his master's every, his master every term of years doesn't make him any less of a slave. And I think that that is one that is um, – like you carry that – you got to carry that one, one with you, especially as an American anarchist for sure. So like in terms of the things that, that stick out to me after this conversation, that one's, that one's deep and uh, yeah, so I, I'd, I'd say that's a good one. Yeah, yeah, Lysander Spooner is amazing, amazing uh, visionary abolitionist of the uh, 19th century. Uh, yeah, I read the book. Um, yeah, treason. Um, what was it called? No treason. Constitution of no authority. Uh, yeah, it's just amazing that somebody like that, you know, wrote that at that time period, and and how you know we are volunteerists, are abolitionists of the 21st century. You know that 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 is the truth. That you know we recognize that you know slavery was not entirely abolished it was just transferred it was just changed you know <laughs> just took a, they just took less of a percentage right <laughs> that's all. Instead, of, instead of taking 100 percent, they were like eh, they'll complain a lot less if we just take 20 and it's worked <laughs> yeah so um yeah awesome conversation vin so uh, before we go please just plug your um the contacts ways people can reach you if they want to follow your sure. work it's very uh, again. It's agorist, so it's very consistent. Uh, yeah. Vinarmani dot com, uh, w- one word of course. At Vinarmani on Twitter, uh, Facebook dot com slash Vinarmani, and YouTube dot com slash Vinarmani. And and check out our show, uh, the Vinarmani show. We stream live on all of those platforms um, every Monday. It's a two hour show every Monday from uh, ten a.m. to noon Pacific time. Beautiful, beautiful. Yes, please everyone check him out. He's doing some great work at the Activist Post and uh, with his podcast. So. You know, we need more content creators like this to get this get this beautiful message of freedom and volunteerism out there to the masses. Um, so awesome conversation. If anyone wants to help me out, you can do so uh, through Bitcoin, Patreon, or PayPal. Links are below. Uh, that's patreon.com slash peaceful anarchism if you want to help me out. Um, dollar show is all I ask. Um, I do these for free, you know, interviewing fascinating people like Vin here. But um, as... We are all capitalists in the end. We respond to incentives, so monetary compensation <laughs> is always encouraged and appreciated. Um, just helps me to uh, do more of what I do. Give me, give me resources, okay? Uh, uh, you know, there's there's opportunity cost to everything we do, right? According to economics, for sure. <laughs> so uh, awesome conversation, Vin. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Uh, so this is Peace Monarchism yeah. on the Voluntary Virtues Network and theseedsofliberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. Wishing all of you have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. 
Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this content and would like to see more of it, please feel free to donate and help me interview other fascinating people. You can do so through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash peacefulanarchism to help me out. A dollar a show is all I ask. If you feel so inclined to donate more, please feel free. It will only assist me in spreading the message of freedom and volunteerism that much farther and that much more efficiently. You can also donate to my Bitcoin. My Bitcoin address is in the description to my videos as well as on my website, peacefulanarchism.com. And while you're on my site, there's a donate button to donate through PayPal. If you prefer to donate through PayPal, you can do so with that. But Patreon is a little bit easier for content creators as you can set up a recurring donation if you so desire. Also, while you're on my website, peacefulanarchism.com, please feel free to sign up, enter your email address, sign up for my newsletter, and you'll receive updates every time I post something, a video or an interview. I do not send out any spam. Or you can also follow me on Facebook under facebook.com slash peaceful anarchism or facebook.com slash Danilo Cuellar 3, I believe. Danilo Cuellar 3. So either, either one of those methods, if you are able to donate, I would be most appreciative. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a magnificent day. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government control 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.